Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. So um, then I would like to, to start um, and, uh, and briefly introduce myself. So my name is Ingrid Ingmann. I'm a physician. I'm um, originally specialized in general medicine, but then uh, decided to join the pharmaceutical development environment and became also a clinical pharmacologist and specialist in pharmaceutical medicine. Um, I have, um, after my switch to, to the medicines development area, I realized very quickly that there is a real big need to consider the ethical aspects of medicines development um, much more intensively and from very pragmatic and practical point of views. And um, so what we have um, done 25 years ago, we created the European Forum for Good Clinical Practice, which is a not-for-profit organization. Um, the idea came up in a discussion in the European Parliament to um, identify in multi-stakeholder discussions how to implement ethical aspects and good clinical practice into our daily life of medicines development in all phases, in all areas. And what happened over time was that uh, at the beginning it was primarily a discussion between pharmaceutical industry representatives and, um, and ethics, uh, ethics committee members. Then over time we managed to get much more interest from uh, clinical researchers from physicians who uh, joined our activities it's not there I have a stick yeah sorry about that I was there and it was tested and it said it's okay ah okay <laughs> so it says cleanam cleanam 2016 yeah. um, and what we so it was industry and ethics, ethics committee members, then um, clinical researchers, and uh, since a couple of years also patients. And this was always thought that this is something that is missing, but we didn't have the opportunity. And now, um, since a couple of years, this is very, very intense involvement. And in this way, EFGCP also got involved in EU projects dealing with uh, patient involvement in uh, medicines development, in new treatment development. And um, we have a very strong interest in finding practical ways of making all stakeholders in medicines development, new treatments development. Is there? The third one, third from the top. Yeah, excellent, thank you so much. Um, so what we try now really to achieve is finding ways and places and opportunities for patients to be involved in the overall medicines development. And in my introduction, I would like to give you just a couple of few general um, ideas and, and informations on what we have worked on and what we have found um, as being really relevant. So let's be clear, patients have um, are bombarded with information about new technologies, molecular targets, genome sequencing, translational medicine, personalized medicine, nanomedicine, HTA assessments. These are all buzzwords that patients hear about and make them more or less suspicious, anxious, unclear what it means for them. On the other hand, gives a lot of hope. And um, sometimes it's even more difficult to manage the hope um, that we are providing with information about new achievements and new opportunities. Um, currently, there is a window of opportunity to involve patients and not only the researchers, regulators and industry into the discussions about best ways forward to develop those type of new treatments. And they are all very complex and to manage complex issues, we know teams, multi-stakeholder teams are the most efficient way of understanding risks and benefits and uncertainties and problems um, and potential um, in, a, in a much broader way because we learn very early on about all the different viewpoints, needs and um, expectations. Now, there is, when we develop new treatments, there is um, experience about the fact that we have not done terribly well so far in many aspects. This is a presentation, uh, an article from Ian Chalmers in The Lancet in uh, 2009 already, where he said, we do not develop really, uh, we, the questions that we investigate are relevant to clinicians, but are they also relevant for patients? Um, or are they even relevant for clinicians? So we address, for scientific reasons, quite a lot of low priority questions. Um, 
Im very important outcomes are not assessed. We don't think about that. This is what we need to assess. And clinicians and patients are very often not involved in setting the research agendas. Well, this is the industry. Um, these are the scientists who set their research agendas, but not those who are ultimately really involved, which is the, or concerned, which is the clinicians and the patients. We do not have really appropriate design and methods, so over 50% of studies are designed without reference to a systematic review of what is already out there. At least it is not visible that this has been done. Um, and over 50% of studies fail to take adequate steps to reduce biases. So they are, from a methodological point of view, insufficient. Over 50% of studies are never published in full. This is the basis for all this transparency discussion that we are having and improvements in transparency that we are um, experiencing at the moment. And biased underreporting of studies um, with disappointing results is usual. Over 30% of trial interventions are not sufficiently described. So we do tests, we do a lot of accept, uh, uh, as, um, uh, assessments in the studies and we do not completely present them in our publications and over 50% of planned study outcomes are not reported. That is of course on one hand a problem that there is limited space in publications and uh, the authors are very much uh, requested to reduce um, the text but that means that about 50% of the outcomes are not known to the rest of the world and cannot impact further research. And most new research is not interpreted in the context of systematic <laughs> assessment of other relevant evidence. So ult ultimately, we have an 85% research waste. I mean, that cannot go on. We really need to do something systematically. So in a nutshell, patient involvement could be a, a means to help to some degree. Of course, this is not the solution. There is not the solution. It's a number of, of, of different elements that have here to be improved. But patients can be an, an important element. And we know from uh, FP7 funded project, patient partner where this was systematically uh, researched, that patients seek up to date, credible, understandable information about new treatment options, about new technologies. They want to be sure that the information they get is reliable. They find a lot of information, but they cannot really judge on how this is really working uh, for them. And they are largely unaware about clinical trials, about translational research, all these keywords, that they have a role in there that they can contribute, that there are means to contribute. Patient advocates are clearly more aware of this and want to participate, but they cannot because they don't have the education and training and there are not enough people who have enough education and training to discuss these issues on eye level. So one of the issues is that, for example, um, patients and um, researchers um, have uh, different, uh, let's say, different valuing of, um, of side effects. So for example, in an oncology drug, there was this uh, assessment here that hair loss was the second most important side effect for patients. The lila is the patient, green is patient and lila is uh, patient representatives. So for them, it was very important for physicians and nurses that was not really relevant. On the other hand, neuropathy was a terrible side effect in the opinion of the physicians, but patients and patient representatives valued that clearly lower than the physicians. So um, Bettina Rill is a very active uh, patient advocate and she put it, uh, brought it to the point, we need to do the right things, not only doing things right. Well, so we really need to go one step further. We all talk about patient centricity, we all want to care for the patient, it's the ethics committees, it's the, the physicians, the industry, um, everyone, the policy makers, everybody says we need to protect the patient. The patient is in the center, but this is very paternalistic. In reality, it's like this. I think we all agree that it's invaluable to have input from local people with real experience of health issues, but they sit there and cannot really contribute. The alibi, alibi patient is nowadays still, in many cases, reality. But from um, best practice examples, we know that impact of patients, if they are involved very early in the process of the development, where even in the, at, in the area of 
finding the clinical question and the clinical problem, definitely also in the clinical trial design phase, is much more efficient in the long run for the development of a new treatment than what is happening at the moment, which is car the patient involvement at a late stage, mostly in patient recruitment and in trial management, like informed consent review and stuff like that. And I don't want to go that into that in detail, but that is from patient representatives who put together all the things that they can do from defining the research priorities to the end of the trial. It's huge. There are so many opportunities. There are so many important things that patients can really contribute. And I know that uh, the speakers will get into some of these points, so I don't, want to, I don't want to go into details, but I just want to give you an impression. Patient involvement is not a punctual thing. Patient involvement has a continuum and many, many different moments in and phases in the development of a drug and or new medicine and a clinical trial um, value that impact. Okay, so to be very honest, I think we are only at the beginning of a development. This is uh, my vision for 2025. I, when I started to work in pharmaceutical industry, that was uh, about 30 years ago, the idea of outsourcing didn't exist. A company did not want to give their baby to a CRO. Nowadays, we cannot develop new medicines anymore without using service providers. This has become absolutely normal. And I think what we are seeing now, there are many things, that uh, many deja vus for me at the moment. When I observe the involvement of patients into the, all these discussions, I think in a couple of years um, it will be absolutely normal to us. But there are a, lot of, a number of barriers that we still have to overcome to make that hap happen. And we need to convince the community of, of medicines developers that it's really helpful and important to include patients into this debate from the beginning um, to, to as an, an, an equal and powerful member of the team. So that was my introduction.